it's great to be here. I'm excited to be here in Barcelona, my first trip here. Uh, I know that Clarion has promoted this as my first speech, I think, outside G2E. If I'm being honest with you, the truth is that I was looking for a place with non-English speakers where I could go and just practice. And then I realized that all, everybody here speaks English and now I'm screwed. So uh, I'm going to give it my best shot, but I, I appreciate being here. I've had a, a great first hundred days uh, at the American Gaming Association. Uh, it's an uh, honor to succeed uh, Frank Ferenkoff and build on the foundation that Frank uh, built in the United States with obviously a very strong organization, an organization that has made an incredible difference for the gaming industry in Washington and beyond. It's great to be here. I've spent uh, the time traveling from Las Vegas to Atlantic City, Tunica, Mississippi, uh, Kansas City, and St. Louis, Missouri, looking at all aspects of the industry that I can find and trying to figure out where is this industry going? Where's the common cause in this industry? What has perhaps defined the gaming industry in the past that needs to be a little bit different in the future? And as I give my remarks today, I'm speaking largely of the, largely of the bricks and mortar industry in the United States. I've got a lot to learn about the online gaming industry. But what I can assure you, because of the background I bring to this and the passion that I bring for associations, is that I have a bias to the role an association can play in increasing the size of business, not just in preventing harm, but helping to grow a business, the, a passion for the role associations can play in touching the consumer, an understanding of the role that online will play with our industry. All of those are things that I embrace and the AGA will embrace uh, going forward. But one of the things that has stood out to me most in my first 100 days is the nature of our association, the nature of our industry. And I don't know if my remote's working here, there we go. The nature of our industry, and this seems apropos given where we are, when I look at the AGA to date, it's an organization that has largely existed to prevent harm. You know, when you look at the role of a goalkeeper, the last line of defense, when everything breaks down in front of you, you're the one who's going to prevent anything else bad from happening. And I think that's the role the AGA has largely played in Washington, preventing anything from happening that would prevent the, or disable the industry's ability to expand, to thrive. But we haven't looked at it through the other lens, which is more offensive. What can we do to help the industry thrive? How can we create a framework where our industry can put some goals up on the board, navigate this difficult experience that we have, and enable the gaming industry to grow beyond the bounds that it would otherwise grow? That's the opportunity I think we have. My experience immediately before this, about seven years in the travel industry in the United States. And if any of you go to the United States frequently and you've noticed any improvements, I hope you've noticed some improvements, in the customs process, in the visa process, if anyone here is from Brazil, they know that the, the wait times just to get an interview for a visa were once 130 days. And they're now down to less than a week to get an interview for a visa to the United States. And that's because we as an industry looked out and said, what are the problems we need to fix to grow our business? How can we help our customers solve their problems so our industry can thrive? That's the attitude we brought to travel. It's absolutely the same attitude we're going to bring to the American Gaming Association. We need to look at things through a more offensive uh, lens. We need to create an environment where the industry can thrive, but by no means is that going to be an easy thing to accomplish. And one of the reasons it's not an easy thing to accomplish is because of the perception that still exists of the gaming industry. So I think before I, I go forward and talk a little bit about some of the questions we're asking about where the industry can go in the United States, it's important to take a little bit of a step back and understand where the gaming industry came from in the United States. And I don't think we can forget this. You know, it's not long ago. It doesn't seem that, it may seem long ago to some, but it really isn't that long ago. A couple decades, the industry was only in Las Vegas. The perception of the industry was one linked to organized crime, was one linked to an industry that was hiding in the shadows. And that created an environment in the United States where most did not want anything to do with gaming. Now we have made enormous strides in recent years. We've made strides in helping people understand that this is an industry that can contribute to communities, that can operate in an appropriate manner. The success we've had as an industry has enabled, at least in the United States, to grow from Nevada to New Jersey and now 37 other, other states with brick and mortar casinos. So obviously the industry has made great strides. But as we go online and as we enter this new environment, we have to continue to think about where we were, what the perception has been, 
and what the threats to that perception may be. The perception for us, our perception is our springboard to growth. And if we don't address the perception issues, we're in trouble in the United States. So as I look around this room and meet people here at EIG who have been in the world of online gaming for many years, many of whom may be frustrated by the past or maybe existing policies in the United States, I think it's important to understand that as a gaming industry in the United States, we have to operate a, as a legitimate industry with trusted partners who protect consumers. Those have to be the basis, that has to be the basis of a, of a successful industry in the United States. The AGA will not oppose competition, albeit we, rep we represent bricks and mortar operators today. We don't oppose competition, but we will oppose anyone who does not want to play by those rules that are critical to the perception of the industry in our country. To the extent that folks want to come in and operate within the regulated and, and legal context, that we, the rules that we play by, we welcome that. And I think you'll see that with the AGA going forward, and I think you'll see that we can be an excellent partner to those that want to work with us under that context. And as we look forward, there are really four questions that I kind of want to run through that we're asking ourselves and questions that I want to ask you. As I said, I'm, I'm new to this industry. I've been on the job 100 days. You don't need to sit up here and listen to me speak for 30 minutes. Many of you have been in this industry many, many more years than I have. So my hope is that we can kind of go through these questions and then open it up, answer some of the questions on your mind, and have a little bit of a discussion. But I think there are four questions that we're asking ourselves at the AGA right now. And it's an opportune time to do that. It's an opportune time for us to really chart the way for our future. Number one is how are we, how good are we at telling this industry's story? How good are we at getting out there and helping people understand the economic engine that gaming is, the way in which we operate, the value add that we provide to communities? My thought, my initial thought 100 days into this is we are not nearly as strong in that area as we need to be. We still operate in many instances from a defensive nature. Some in the industry ashamed of the industry in which they work. I'm proud to be a part of this industry. And I can tell you the AGA is going to be an unapologetic zealot, champion for the value of gaming. But we have to improve our storytelling. We have to improve the way that we talk about the value of this industry, the way we tackle head on the challenges associated with this industry. Those are things we have to do going forward, and I think our storytelling is the first place to start. The second question that we're asking ourselves is what does a pro-gaming agenda look like? We'll continue to prevent harm. Folks that have bad ideas that want to harm the gaming industry, we'll continue to prevent that. But what does a pro-gaming agenda look like? And I think when we start talking about a pro-gaming agenda, we have to start with the area of regulation. Now, by no means is the AGA or the American gaming industry anti-regulation, but we are anti-duplicative policies. We are anti-things that prevent us from being efficient, that prevent us from innovating. How do we look at regulation in a way that we can modernize regulation? That's the question we're asking ourselves. And I think the great challenge we have, at least in the United States, and one that all of you should be aware of as you look at online gaming in the United States, is the gaming industry is viewed in one of three buckets. We're either viewed in the United States as evil, as you could say we might be in Utah, Hawaii, other states that have kept gaming out. We're viewed as an economic engine in Nevada, New Jersey, Mississippi. And we're viewed as a necessary evil just about everywhere else. And that necessary evil is why you end up with a tax rate in Pennsylvania of 55%. That necessary evil perspective is why you end up with a regulatory process in many states across America that prevent innovation, that harm our ability to provide our customer with the products that they're looking for. Our challenge as we look at a pro-gaming agenda is how do we move these places in the United States and perhaps around the world who see this industry as a necessary evil to see this industry as the economic engine that it is. You know, in the brief time in the industry, what's really stood out to me is the community partner that our casinos are, the jobs that we create, the way we treat our employees, the value that we bring. You know, when I look at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a place where there's a major Sands casino, a place where steel making used to be the big business. That moved out, and here you had a community that was on its last legs. Gaming comes into that community, strengthens the community, builds new champions and elected officials and local businesses, and yet we haven't told that story. 
telling that story is part of building that programming agenda and helping our industry be understood as an economic engine rather than a necessary evil. One example of telling our story is exactly what we're doing out there right now with this new movie, Runner, Runner. Now, if anyone's seen it, what I've heard is the movie's absolutely terrible. But that matters, that matters little to us. The question we're asking is how do we take something like this and leverage it to share the story that we want to share? We as an industry have to come out of the shadows, take these things head on, and be creative with sharing our message as to the value of this industry. The third question we're asking is about growth. Where is the growth to be had? How can we grow this industry? You know, the way we've looked at it in the United States is we'll just keep expanding. And we see growth as putting new properties here, there, and everywhere else. But what we're also seeing is a little bit of cannibalization of our own product. There just aren't enough customers to go around right now. Which leads me to ask, who are the next customers? And that's the question we're asking at the AGA. 34% of Americans say they visited a casino in 2012. That number actually seems high to me, but we'll, we'll go with it. 34% said they went. Who are the 66% that didn't go? Why didn't they go? What percentage of that group is undecided about going? What would they need to do or know about gaming to change their decisions? That's the question we have to ask ourselves with a pro-growth agenda. How do we help our customer, or could be customer, access this product? How do we make this product more attractive to them? It's a major question that we're asking, and it's about the AGA's new focus on growth and being a growth-oriented organization in addition to preventing bad things from happening. The final question we're asking ourselves, and I think this room knows this best, but do we understand this new next generation of gamer? You know, when you look at Las Vegas in particular right now, and you look at the club scene there, you look at the various other ways that revenue is being driven, two-thirds of the revenue on the Las Vegas Strip being non-gaming revenue. It speaks to what some of this next generation wants to do. People spending $10,000 for a poolside cabana and never entering the casino, which to me is a huge indictment of the product that we're offering. They're willing to spend $10,000 here and get this temporary cabana, then take a chance on doubling their $10,000 and making it $20,000. That's an indictment of the product that we're offering. What is it that would get that customer to come in the door? Do we understand that next generation? And I think the answer today, largely within our industry, is that we don't. We just have this hope that when they get to a certain age, they'll decide, I want to play slot machines. But I think the evidence suggests that's not going to happen. These are folks that grew up with Atari and Nintendo, Microsoft Xbox and, and PlayStation and everything else, social this, social that, their iPads. The devices that we're offering don't have that same type of social interaction. They don't have that same sense, at least on my end, of being skill-based, which is what more and more people want. We have to figure out how we reach that generation. It's a, a question, again, that the AGA is asking, that the broader American gaming industry is asking. It's a new role for the AGA. And I think as, when you look at this organization, what you're going to see, regardless of what your perceptions of the organization, the industry of the past may have been, I think what you're going to see is an organization that's proactive, very much looking more like Messi than we are like Peter Cech, trying to put some goals up on the board. An organization that is willing to get out there, take some of these issues head on, be unapologetic in our championing of the value of this industry. And lastly, I think you're gonna see an organization that is interested in being a partner with everyone in this room and beyond who is interested in partnering with us. We'll be quite transparent as to what we're doing and why we're doing it. The AGA does not exist to champion one company or one set of companies. We exist to grow gaming, grow casino gaming. That's what our mission is, that's what the value is. We look forward to partnering with many of you to do that. I'm gonna be here over the next couple days. I look forward to having individual conversations with folks about how we can work together in a more coordinated fashion. I thank Clarion for the opportunity to come out here. As I said at the outset, I wanna keep this brief and have more of a dialogue with you. Happy to discuss the state of online gaming in the United States, as disappointing as that may be to many of you. Um, but happy to have that discussion, but I'll pause now, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. There's a microphone coming up. Hello, thank you. 
Um, my question is, we look at some of the uh, online partnerships that the American casinos have formed. Um, a lot of European operators, a lot of foreign operators, which is totally fine. But is there a way to stimulate more American activity uh, in that sector, in the online space? And um, what could the AGA do about it? I think everybody heard the question about how can we get more American companies interested in the online space. Obviously, MGM has partnered with BWIN Party and uh, others have partnered with other companies around the, around the world. I, I think right now there are a lot of very interested parties in the American marketplace, many of whom are here at this conference, who are sitting on the sidelines. You know, to the extent that we have Nevada, New Jersey, and Delaware, this isn't a marketplace right now that seems to have uh, a significant amount of opportunity. I think there's no shortage of entrepreneurs, there are no shortage of brilliant minds in the United States who would love to be more involved with online gaming, but they need to have a sense of what's this road forward? Where's this thing going to go? What's going to happen at the federal level? What's going to happen in California? What's going to happen in New York State and elsewhere? And until that, some of those pieces fall into place, I think you're going to continue to have a lot of folks sitting on the sidelines. That's the sense that we get. Uh, for those, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and take it head on, for those wondering what's next, when, when do we get a better sense? I, I think by the end of this year, we're going to have a better sense of where things are going in the U.S. market. And the reason I think that is because I think the window is rapidly shutting on the federal government doing anything in, in the case of online gaming, or in America at least, the federal government doing anything. Um, as most people know, we have a very politicized uh, environment where, uh, where the sides can't even come together to agree on a budget, let alone an online gaming framework. Uh, but I think it's more likely than ever that this issue is going to go on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, we at the American Gaming Association are disappointed with that outcome because we think we'd all be better off if we had some, uh, uh, some a framework that worked across the, uh, the state lines. Uh, we think there should be some minimum standards for consumer protections, for age verification, uh, for responsible gaming, a framework for tribes to participate. But it doesn't look like we're going to get that. We'll be active, uh, as many here in this room will be, as this goes state by state, trying to provide guidance as to what good policy would be. But I think the environment's going to, I think we're going to have a sense of where it's going finally, but I think it's going to be a more difficult environment than the one that many of us wished for uh, at the federal level. Other questions? This is too easy of an outcome. If not, oh, we got two from the same, go for it. You and I will go on the side. We'll just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I was just wondering if you could um, uh, maybe share more details, or maybe more ideas about um, how the AGA can be involved in that state-by-state -state, uh, process as things develop. Will you, uh, will you advise? Um, what are some of your personal opinions as well? Uh, you know, coming yeah. after. Mr. Ferenkopf, um, what are some of your own personal impressions of how this is developing and what perhaps you should be doing different? Yeah, traditionally, the AGA has not been active at a state level. We've been focused on Washington, D.C. Uh, I think we need to go and I think we need to fish where the fish are biting. And if the industry is dealing with challenges at the state level, we need to be there. And if our industry is dealing with challenges outside the United States, we need to be there. The AGA is only going to grow more active. As we look at the state level and what, what is about to happen, I think one uh, obvious area for us to engage is to work with partners, partners in the tribal community, partners uh, in the uh, manufacturing community, and in other areas to coalesce a bit around some best practices and standards that we would encourage these states to adopt. The last thing we need is vastly different policies in Maryland vis-a-vis -vis Pennsylvania vis-a-vis -vis Illinois. It's going to create uh, costs for everyone in the industry. It's going to inhibit innovation. It's going to create a product that, frankly, allows the black market to continue to thrive because it's going to be more streamlined for the consumer. So I think we need to come to agreement with these other parties that we typically haven't worked with on some basic best practices here. Those conversations are beginning already. I think it's important that we speak as a broader gaming industry with one voice, lest we wind up with a regulatory uh, structure that's a, a morass. Michael. Thanks, Jeff. Um, innovation was your, your fourth box, and I couldn't agree with you more. But some, uh, I guess the policies for innovation would uh, require kind of more liberal um, scope of what we could include in gaming and on the gaming floor. And how do you spur that? How do you get regulators behind that? Yeah. How do you ease 
uh, regulating and testing so that that can be achieved in the United States as it's often achieved in Europe and in jurisdictions like Malta. And is that contrary to your first box, which is keeping the runner-runner scenario out and chilling out every, uh, everyone in America that gaming is going to be okay at the ball at the same time kind of opening and, and widening what you can and can't regulate? Yeah, I think, I think we have a great challenge in the fact that the way the consumer wants to consume the product, the regulators oftentimes will not allow us to provide the product in that manner whether it's a more skill-based game, whether it's a more interactive experience, social, so on and so on, we're not permitted to give the customer the product in the way they want it. So how do we change that? I, I truly believe the most important thing we can do, and the most important thing that all of us have to do and spend, dedicate time to doing, is position this industry as an economic engine. To the extent that we're seen as, a, as an area where people feel guilty participating, as an area where uh, bad things can happen where um, people who should not be trusted are participating, we are at risk, or we're at least at risk of a status quo environment. To the extent we can convince regulators, and it's not going to happen overnight, it's going to happen over years, that this is a mainstream business playing by the rules, attracting some of the most uh, uh, you know, commonplace people uh, that could possibly participate, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to be in that status quo environment. The AGA is going to be focused on moving the perception of the industry from guilty pleasure to mainstream business. It's going to be the single most important thing we do. And the more states and areas that we can take from looking at this industry as a necessary evil to looking at it as an economic engine, the better off the industry will be. And I think it's that transition from necessary evil to economic engine that the regulators will follow. But until we get here, we're going to wind up with the status quo. We're going to wind up with ridiculous tax rates. We're going to wind up with ridiculous inhibitions on what it is that we can offer. And that's why I think that everybody, the last point I'll make on that, that's why I think it's in all of our interests, at least to the, I can only speak for the American market, it's in all of our interests that anybody who is operating in a manner that is not um, protecting consumers, anyone who is operating in a manner that is not living up to the perception that we've built, we should all be against that because it will drive down the image of this industry in the long run. It will prevent innovation and it will encourage regulators to continue to turn the screws tighter than they need to turn them. Thank you for your time. Do we have time for one more question, John, or no? One more. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Whilst we haven't yet met, and Jeff represents the president of the American Gaming Association, I'm the president of the Gaming Standard Association. And, and as Jeff pointed out, whilst he's focused and based in DC, there's a lot of groundwork that gets done between the vendors, the uh, industry domain, as I call it, which is operators and manufacturers, as well as the policy domain, which are the regulators. And as you know, in the United States, Nevada's got crafted regulations, you've got New Jersey doing regulations. We have to be very careful that if we don't get some level of harmonization or some level of standards across the various regulators, that we're going to actually harm our industry more than we're going to help it. So, Whilst Jeff is dealing with the higher level political issues, I deal with the lower technology kind of issues on the Gaming Standard Association. And I'd like to share and answer one of the questions which I think you've asked, which is absolutely very relevant. How can we help build the bridge? Because I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow. And I do believe that collaboration between the policy and industry man, is vital for this industry to continue to grow, and especially in the United States, to facilitate faster adoption in, in, in this big country. So. Well, and, and along those lines, I'll just close with that partnership, that cooperation is what we're looking for. I'd like to continue the discussion and figure out how we work together. I completely agree that if we don't do this, the outcome will be worse uh, than it otherwise needs to be. So we're looking for those partners. We're looking to find ways to work together. I appreciate, again, the invitation from Clarion and look forward to, to working with everybody here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it.